Good morning, YouTube friends. This whole video is all about spinning fiber. It starts back in the fall with some spinnery store fiber I bought, and it finishes just this morning as I finally turn it into a skein. So I hope you enjoy this long process, and there's lots of cat in here too. All right, it's time to make some rolags again. I've got to start something new with spinning. But first of all, you have to make the yarn. Now, I have been thinking about this beautiful stuff here. And do you know that that is undyed? That is just a combination of various colors of sheep's wool merino. Isn't that beautiful? And then I pulled this out and I thought, ooh, that's so pretty. There's so much variety in there. There's even some kind of blue. Yeah, a little bit of orangey, light brown something. That's beautiful. Um, but I'd love to include a little bit of the green. A little bit of the green. And this is looking a little more teal on the camera, but it's actually just a an evergreen, a real evergreen. Okay, and then those are all very subdued colors, so I would need a little something to make it pop. I'm wondering if I need a little yellow. Not, not big hunks of it, just a little bit. This morning, I'm going to make a bunch of roll eggs and put them in a basket so that when it's time to spin, I'll be ready to go. You know, I did up some of those roll eggs with that spinnery store yarn, and I pulled them out and looked at them. I'm like, that's really green. I don't really like the green. But the thing is, I have no idea what this will look like when it's spun up. The fiber, when it's in like this, doesn't look anything like it does when you mix it with other fibers and put it into a roll egg. Um, and then when you spin it up, it doesn't look anything like these. Anyway, what I decided to do this morning was instead of blending colors, I thought I would just make roll eggs out of this by itself because it's kind of already a blend. As you can see, it's a blend of different natural uh, wools. And then I thought, I wonder if I can just, I mean, I'm sure I can, especially at this point, um, just spin straight off of this roving instead of messing with the hand carters. I wonder how hard that will be. So I'm going to do that some this morning and see what I come up with. If I could just spin off the roving, it would be a lot easier. The hand carters are wonderful for blending colors, but these are, this is roving that's really already blended. Now here's this bobbin so far. I started it, oh, sometime in the fall. You see it had some of the green in there. Really was not fond of that particular green. Um, so I'm trying to minimize it um, and hope that this darker stuff will dominate when I go back and do that. So we will see. I don't know what I'm gonna make with this yet. I have no idea. I guess I've always felt like the key is to make your yarn first and then make something else with it later. This is a tricky joint. As most of you probably already know, <clears throat> this is a Fantasia wheel from the Kromsky Company. It's a castle style wheel, which means that it sits straight in front of you with the wheel in front of your knees. It's a double treadle, which I love. So both of my feet are going together and the yarn goes into the center. I used to wish that I could spin for just a few minutes straight without having something go wrong, the wheel go wrong, my yarn break, something catches, stops feeding, the tension's bad, whatever. Now, with a better wheel, with plenty of roving, I can sit here and spin straight without any stopping or interruptions, really, um, for an hour. The only time you have to stop is when this starts to fill up and you have to move it down. See this darker section here? 
this is, has a little bit of a barber pulling effect. As you can see that stripiness. I'm hoping some of that will go away when um, when I do my plying. I love to weave with my homespun yarn, but I'm kind of scared to put it under the pressure of the warp. So I've thought about using something else for the warp and using my homespun for the weft. The bubble just came in the room and hid underneath my desk. He's been acting kind of strange lately. Of course, we did add a cat to the house, and then we brought in a couple of babies at Christmas, and then Adam and I went away for a couple of nights, so the poor dog is, he's had his routine thrown off, and he is a Pomeranian, so he's very, let me try to draw closer to the orifice so you can see what I'm doing. What I'm really looking at is the thickness of the fluffy yarn before it goes between my pinched fingers. I'm looking for it to be just the right amount or the as it goes across my middle finger right here looking for it to be the kind of the right width and I haven't been spinning for a while and I'm not as good at it as I was so I need to practice up some you see, I'm working too close to the orifice, and so this yarn is not having enough time in here to spin as much as it should, and so it's not getting as much twist in it as it needs. So when I stopped and I looked down there, I was like, hmm, some of that is not very twisty. It's better now, but um, you have to be careful with that because if you don't have enough twist in your yarn, it can come apart. Like if I pull this, it would come apart. The only thing that holds it together is having all that twist that you have in here. That makes it quite strong. Oh. I have to remind myself to spin to the right, and then later I will ply to the left. I do like spinning off of row legs. When you get to the end of a row leg, it gives you a chance to take a little break, give your legs a rest. When I used to do, um, use a hackle with a diz, I would end up with a huge ball of very slim roving, very slim roving, really something more like that, um, to spin off of. And goodness, that would last forever. Now, see, so here's a big wad here. See that? Because it's turning the wrong way. It's not, it needs to be elongated that way. Sometimes you just have to stop and straighten things out. This roving is such a beautiful blend of multiple deep colors and jewel tones. I'm mixing it with this. This is all natural color. This was not dyed at all. It's all the various, there even seems to be some pink in there. I don't know, it can't be, but these are all the different natural colors of the sheep. It's very soft. I've been wondering if I prefer carding or dizzing. Maybe I should do both and remind myself if I like dizzing using my hackle. I have to pull it just off the bottom here. Just like that. goal is to keep all of these fibers are already straight and you know beautifully pulled out in the roving so you just don't want to wad any of it up. I'll show you one of my frustrations in using cards and that is this border up here. No matter what you do you end up with this wad up here and it does get a little, I'll show you what it does. Just this, this up at the top is a frustrating edge. 
Now because this is all very, very clean, I'm not trying to get out any of the um, really one pass like that. You see how beautifully it's blended now is enough. Of course, it will blend and change even more when I spin it. But this is the edge I'm talking about right here. I don't like that edge. And I have not discovered any way to get rid of it. Because um, as I said, all these fibers should all be straight and long. I want these ones to look like these ones down here. I don't know what to do about that. If anybody out there has a secret answer to that. This is how you get it off of the tines easily. I've got too much stuff on my desk. So what usually ends up happening is that that edge that I don't like, even some of this, see in the middle there? You just, um, if you want to spin a really fine, thin yarn, those things, those little bumps, they get in your way. I usually end up just rolling in the middle and hoping for the best when I go to spin. But I'm not a, anything close to a perfectionist when I spin, because I can't be, because I can't be perfect. So I've got a little basket of five roll eggs of this so far in it. I did try a minute ago to see if I could spin. And see, when I'm putting it on here, I'm really trying hard not to have much up here at the top. It doesn't matter how hard I try to have some up there. Um, anyway, I was saying a few minutes ago, I did try to spin straight from the roving. Actually, I tried to spin and combine these two colors as I was spinning from the roving. It, it was frustrating and not very fun too thick too. So there's some advantages to separating out your fibers beforehand, whether you do it with a hackle, whether you do it with um, a drum carter, whether you do it with hand carters, doing something to it. I'm sure there are people who spin straight from, this is a very thick roving. It's pretty thick. I was going to say as thick as my wrist. I don't know if that's true. But it's pretty thick. I don't prefer to spin from that thick of a roving. Put a little bit more of this on here. I just find this to be so calming. I've been waiting to do this. Well, let's watch carefully and see what happens here. What if I pull on these? When they went on, they were straight. I don't know why they, excuse me for doing that. I should be able to pull them off straight. Maybe I should do another pass. Maybe that's part of the problem. Let's try that. This is what I would do if I were working with something that still had some DM in it. Okay, so if I pull, that's that rough edge. Maybe that will help. But am I going to create another difficult edge up at the top? I just don't know. See, now I've put it there. Boy, that looks pretty hairy, doesn't it? I do suspect that hand carters blend the colors, but I don't think they do much for keeping the individual fiber strands straight. Next time I go see my friend, who's my spinning mentor, I haven't seen her in a while. I may have to ask her about this. I don't think I've seen her since I got my Carters. She has everything. She might be able to tell me. The 
that is a now that's a nice blend with plenty of the white in there but it still maintains that dark complex color tone that I like hmm. well it'll be interesting oh that's nice isn't it See how I pass the fiber across my ring finger to examine how much of it I have, how wide it is, how thin it is, the combination of color, and I still have time to slow and adjust if I want to. This is where you can determine how thin you want your single ply to be. And if you leave enough space here to get plenty of twist, that's where you can really get into a strong single ply that has very little fiber. But the twist is what holds it together. I'm not really consistent, but I don't worry about it much. twist a bit it allows you to put this in and then release the twist to grab the new so I can just combine it by doing that so I can twist it a bit and then let it join and if you think about it you can get it pretty seamless yellow. Sometimes I turn my hand over this way, give my fingers a break in a new position. But 
There's no right and wrong way to do it. I pull the fiber from a rollide wherever the fiber wants to go. You can incorporate, like I can, I can start bringing in that white if I want to, but I try not to fight against it too much. Let the fibers, as they're already connected, let them go in. You're giving, I'm giving it a little tug. Whenever I feel a thickness in a lot of fiber, you give it a tug until it kind of just releases. See, that's too thin, so I have to stop, overlay, pull that little twist, pull till it releases. Let that twist build up. There's just a thick portion in here that didn't get out of the way when I was carving. That's why I don't like to spin directly from the roving because it's all that way and you have to tug too much. The carding really separates the fibers and makes this makes the drafting easier. the end of that little lad. I twist it around my tension peg to hold on to it. All right. Hi YouTube friends. Good morning. It's very cold outside. I tried to go start a burn barrel and came back in because I was freezing and discovered that it was 28 degrees out there <laughs> Fahrenheit. So um, I'm back inside and I'm going to work on this yarn that I've been spinning. I'm going to I'm going to use that method that I did before. I'll post a link up there. It's um, it's a two ply um, plying method where you take the single ply off of the bobbin and you put it onto your wrist, onto your hand, with both ends exposed, and then you ply back onto the bobbin from your hand. So um, it's, it's interesting and different. Um, I won't go into all the detail, but that's what I'm going to do with this because I tried to stop about halfway through the um, making the single ply and adding in a lot of yellow because I didn't want it to be barber pole with yellow and uh, kind of brown, but I wanted for there to be some yellow in there. So I want to see how this turns out. This will be interesting. So I'll just give you a little snippets of this. I won't take you through the whole painful process. All right. Thanks. I'm part way through, as you see, it's beginning to mound up. I wanted to show you my bobbin over here because this color down here represents what I was doing at first, which didn't include any yellow. And then uh, this is more recent single ply on the bobbin. And um, I added the yellow and some of it is very yellow. So that's the combination I'm looking for with lots of, um, there's lots of gray in there and there's a lot of um, kind of off-white so hopefully this will be a, a really 
nice complicated looking yarn. I'm almost to the end of this bobbin and you see the colors that I was choosing at the beginning of this is a big bobbin and there's a lot of green in there. I kind of forgotten about that. I didn't like the green much so we'll have to see how it goes with all that yellow on the other end. Okay, well this has turned out to be a very large ball. And uh, here's my leader, still attached. And here's my original tail. And now I'm going to slip this off of those middle fingers. My hand is tired of having this on there, so it's going to feel nice to bring it down. And I think I'm supposed to bring this out here. And then you can just undo the slip knot. And that never got spun very well. So um, so now I have these two. And because it's now a bracelet, boy, look at that. <laughs> um, I can now attach this to my leader. I think I'll put it through the loop. Knot it off. Little kitty came back. Hope that doesn't yank off. Okay. Now let's release enough of this to match the other. This will be an interesting color. Mm. All right. Now I need to, I'm not going to take you through the whole plying process, maybe just a little bit, but I have to get um, my dry band back on. Well, this is working well. It looks, oh, there he goes. So this is going to be. Pretty easy plying um, from here. You just have to kind of fiddle your wrist around to release the um, both of them. But I think this is going to work well. Yeah, as you see here, the leader is coming off my hand this way. The darker one on the inside is going the opposite direction. But I don't think it presents any difficulties. I will say that this right here is the look I'm kind of going for that I hope I get on a lot of this um, skein. I don't know if I'll get it everywhere. The yellow isn't pervasive on half of it, but we'll see, hopefully a good bit of it. window whenever I'm in the studio but he stayed here a really long time while I'm spinning he doesn't seem very interested in running away but I wonder if the sound of it is putting him to sleep you see the bobbin's getting pretty full I hope I can get I don't know why I wouldn't be able to get it all on there it all came off of there so why couldn't I get it back on And I am getting yellow pretty fairly consistently so far. Mm. This is a much bigger ball and has presented a few more tangling problems, mostly in the big part, not the middle part. The middle part performs well. It's the big part around my wrist that seems to be more um, problematic.
almost to the end. At the end here, it's very deep purple. This end is the best part, and it's the reason why I do this type of strange wrist bobbin type of plying. Because when you get to the end, there is no leftover. That's your end. And I love having no leftover single ply. So I'm going to take this off. I don't have time right now to finish this, and I'm just going to loop it around my um, tensioning peg down there. <clears throat> All right. There you go. Hi, YouTube friends. Here's Leo. He's such a sweet... He's a kitten. He's not really a cat. Oh, Bobo is very jealous. Bobo's down there going, Mom, why does Leo get to be on YouTube? And I don't, You want to come up here? You want me to pick you up, don't you? Okay. So here's Bobo and Leo. They are not friends. <laughs> But they both want to, well, Leo doesn't really want to be on my lap. I think Bobo does. Okay, Leo, you go on down there. Now Bobo will stay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is what I do for a lot of my day is manage animals. No, you be nice to my rug. Okay, so today I'm going to take the, um, oh, and he knocks stuff over. He's so bad. Now he and Tricky are, he and Tricky are playful friends. I have now talked for 55 seconds and not said anything. <laughs> I'm taking this the plied yarn off of my spinning wheel today, putting it onto my knitty knotty, gonna steam it a little bit. I really do want these fibers to fluff up and um, meld a little bit better. Bobo's licking his paws. <laughs> and, um, and what I wanna see is this blending that I do. I spend a lot of time blending I buy yarns that are already blended sometimes, and then I blend those with other blended yarns on my cards, and then I spin a single, which is also kind of a blending, and then you ply it, which is more blending, and, and so you, you have no idea what color look you're going to get. What is this yarn going to look like? And I see people's yarn um, on these wonderful YouTube groups, people who sell their yarn that they spin, and it's so gorgeous in its color. And I would like to try to achieve that myself. Oh, look, see, there's Leo over there. He's looking out the window. See, now I have officially become a cat person. And so um, he's gradually bonded to me more. And last night, he jumped up and lay on the sofa next to me, and I put my hand on him. And then later, he crawled up in my lap and then on my chest. And then he got right in my face. And then later, he leaned his forehead against my forehead. And I don't remember where I read that, but I think that that kind of means that the cat has picked you as his person. Okay, so um, let's go use the nitty knotty. Okay, Bobo, you got to get down. I'm so sorry. He's giving me that look of mama. Your world is all about me, isn't it? If I kiss him enough and pester him, then he'll want to get down. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, so here's my nitty knotty. They're at um, angles to each other, these ends. You can turn them, okay, but you want it to look like this. I always start with the near end in the middle in my hand. And you wind it so that you don't have to move that hand. It can just stay. Of course, I took my scotch tension off so that my... All of this... All of this work that you do with your wool, because this is wool, this is all merino. It all is going to felt it just a little bit. People often think of felting as a bad thing, but it's just a fluffing of the fibers as long as you don't overdo it. You really do want it to rub on as few things as possible before it gets there. Okay, well, you don't have to watch me do this endlessly. Um, so I'll show it to you, maybe as I'm steaming it or something. All right. Well, I've got it all on the nitty knotty. And of course, I tied a little knot 
on each end. And the ends actually seem to be kind of meeting in one spot. Anyway, I'm going to tie this off so that all of the strands will stay nice and tidy. Um, I'll bend this down and you can watch. I like to tie it in four places and since these two ends overlap just a little bit on this bundle, um, I'll put one right between them to keep them very tidy. Now I'm doing a nice loose bow. You want to be able to take this out afterward. It's only temporarily keeping the bundle straight while you do whatever kind of a, I guess um, if you're a weaver, you would maybe call this kind of a wet finish, um, which is what you do to a weave after you're done with it and you take it off your loom, you wet finish it to kind of plump all the fibers up, especially if it's wool, and it just makes the weave look much nicer and smoother. Um, anyway, we're trying to plump these fibers out, get them to bind together. I put mine in a little stovetop steamer and set an alarm. One time I didn't set an alarm and I cooked some alpaca till it was burnt and adhered to the steamer. <laughs> that was very bad. But after you put so much work into something, you don't want to burn it. Okay, so there you go. And now I'm just going to pop this off of one arm. And um, this is my nice long skein. And you're familiar with this. I mean, if you twist this, if you keep your fingers in the ends, which I'm not doing very well, and you twist it and twist it and twist it and twist it till it starts to kind of go back on itself and you put one loop inside of another loop then you'll get that kind of uh, the kind of skein those beautiful skeins you see so this is this is ignore the baby blue <laughs> this is the um yarn i'm gonna get one I'm, just, I'm, I'm pleased with that there's there's lots of yellow throughout most of it there's a lot of that um, mahogany that's that purple through most of it the kind of gray um, is that natural and it really is through all of it. There's a little bit of green in there, which that's the pine. I'm not real fond of it. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go cook the wool. Okay, there it is in the pot. Doesn't that look strange? Well, I've set that yarn on for 15 minutes. It'll take it, oh, I don't know, four minutes to come to a boil. Meanwhile, I'm having a cup of tea. I made some tea and forgot about it, but I didn't leave the tea bag in, so it's not over steep. But it is that um, Yorkshire Gold tea that is just so wonderful. It's really dark. I did. I've got this little. I used to have a thing for little pitchers. I had little pitchers, way too many little pitchers, and I've gotten rid of a lot of them. But I still have a few. This is kind of a weird Art Deco looking one. I think I'm going to keep that around. It's not delicate and it's not fine. If it gets broken, it won't break my heart. Um, but I think I'm going to have a lot of tea this winter in my studio, and I'm going to keep that little pitcher in here with milk each day for the back and fridge at night. Mm. Oh, they're barking again. See ya. Okay, I've I flipped it over and steamed it another 10 minutes on the other side. So it's had a total of 20 minutes. It is very hot. But, and so it's got nice heat into, into the wool and it's damp, but it's not sopping wet. And that's really an advantage to steaming it over, say, washing it and immersing it. Okay, so it's damp enough, looking pretty. Now I'm gonna go thwack it really hard on a door jam. That's when, you, when it's cool enough, you hold it on one end and you just whack it at length, um, like, couple times one way and then I rotate it a couple times another way um okay all right this is how I whack it just like this this scares the dogs to death thankfully Tricky's on the back porch now this is this is supposed to set the twist I'm not really um I know that you want your twist to be nice and set why this does it I don't know I've also seen people put a towel on the floor and hit it on the floor. What would happen if I didn't do that? I don't know. It's already cool enough to handle and only a little bit wet. I'm gonna leave these ties on here until it's all the way dry. 
Um, it should dry quickly in the house because it's really dry this time of year. Okay. So there's my yarn so far. I like all those mixes of colors.